Welcome to the AI Ireland podcast, your window into the world of AI innovation on the island of Ireland. Join us as we explore how AI is harnessed to tackle both business and societal challenges, revealing the cutting edge solutions emerging from this vibrant AI community. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and insights in the world of AI. Hi everyone, it's Mark Kelly here and you are listening to the AI Ireland podcast. I hope you're well, whatever you're doing today. And I have the pleasure of speaking with Pedro Eta Serrano. And Pedro is joining us on the podcast today. And he's got a wealth of experience in data analytics, data science, and actuary as a strong foundation. Pedro, thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really interested in speaking with you because you've been working in the world of uh, financial services, have a hat, have an actuary hat on, data analytics, data science. You've worked in consulting services in the past. You've kind of got close to customers. You understand the problems, services. And when I think about actuary, I think back to when people, I was doing my leave insert, which was coming up to me about 17 or 18. And you always remember actuaries they get like 600 points they're leaving, which is like their top, top results in the leaving, if not more. I think they did applied maths and even surpassed it. So you needed to be very, very bright to become an actuary. So it's a very strong foundation uh, to have. But within the world of statistics, data analytics and data science, I'm sure there's a lot of ways that you can have to automate some of those decisions that you help to to make and you know when I think of actors I also think of kind of like life insurance and things like this when, when someone is going to die unfortunately or what's the probability of certain things uh, happening as, as well within that so how did you come into this world in Spain and then to come to Ireland tell us a little about your journey it, it's some of a coincidence in my case is in my, my background is uh, my degree originally was in statistics and operations research so all these things that now we call data science, I studied all that. At the time we called the statistics, you know, neural networks and these things. And I just happened to finish my degree when there was a big recession in Spain. And I knew I would eventually find a job, but didn't know how long it was going to take. So I didn't want to be hanging around doing nothing and waiting. So I, I started doing something else. I looked around and somebody told me about the actuarial science. And the thing that called me is when I said there is no unemployment there. You know, you finish that, you get a job, and it's a good job. I said, well, that's it, I'm doing that. And that's how I became an actor. And when I started working on that, I, I loved it. Like it is a, I know insurance has a bad reputation for being boring and that, but when, when you actually get inside as an actor, it's fascinating. You know, there are very, very interesting problems to be solved, and it has a huge impact in society. It going off on a bit of a tangent, but this is just an itch that I have for myself. <clears throat> When you were you looking at kind of data and insights where you could say, well, this person is a smoker, a drinker, they live in this location, their likelihood of dying will be increased by X versus they live in this location, they don't drink, they don't smoke, and they don't do 25 minutes of exercise per day or something. It, does this all really feed into how you're making these decisions or are you going into so much more detail or I'm just kind of simplifying the whole process? Well, the, yeah, it, it actually insurance can be extremely detailed nowadays. Now there are there are some uh, boundaries as to what you can do, and that, those are generally a, an European directive, and and that meant that you cannot say price insurance based on gender. So there are some details that they they're available; they could be meaningful from a statistical point of view, but you cannot take into account. So you have to to work a fine, you know, a, a thin line there between what's what's available, but what's, what's feasible from a technological point of view and what's actually permissible from not just legislation, but also what society would say, well, that's actually fair use of the data or what it is not. So there, there's there's a line in terms of what you need to manage and, and from, from an ethical perspective. So how does an actual services and data science kind of come together now? And because life insurance doesn't necessarily spark to me as the most innovative in terms of trying different things or try, and I know there's certain companies that will be looking to adopt and looking mm -hmm. to introduce new technologies to it, but it doesn't seem to be an industry that's changing like maybe other industries are. Yeah. Well, I think um, you see, there's been tremendous innovation in insurance, but generally it's not always in a way that the, 
that consumers find it obvious. It may be happening in the background in, in how companies operate, how the markets are regulated. So, and I think uh, the insurance industry, we have not been very good at, communi at communicating these things to an audience. And that, that's true. But there's been a lot of uh, innovation in terms of, for example, uh, mortality modeling. That's all now, all AI. You know, it's just obviously, unless you're an actor, you don't necessarily read about it. But it's taking the more sophisticated modeling into account and it's a wonderful uh, development, but that's certainly it. What happens is that then much of what's, uh, what, what we call uh, machine learning or data science was part of the toolkit of an actor. We just didn't call it like that, but it was part of it. But also there are many relevant uh, skills that actors have to feel that are also useful when it comes to data science. And, and some of them go, go into the areas of, uh, they're not very sexy, but they're very important, like governance or ethics. And those are things that we actually have been managing for, for a very long time. Yeah. And you're also going to have, <clears throat> you're going to have a lot of built in <clears throat> compliance around yeah. everything that you do, because like the healthcare sector, finance sectors have got a lot of compliance built in. You're always managing yeah. through that. You're always kind of have to explain your decisions, your models. So it's not like something that's new with the EU AI Act that's coming in that you need to reinvent the wheel. It's always been kind of built in and baked in. Sometimes when you're automating some of these decisions, they don't necessarily go the way you want and people have been infringed upon because of the, the data set, but that can be like a lot of industries. So when you're looking at the customers and the segmentations that you're trying to get closer to, I'm guessing there's a full suite of the data analytics and marketing journey that you need to understand for those customers you're looking to try to serve from an internal perspective and then you've also got it from an external perspective as well so there's a there's so many different projects you can be working on oh, absolutely but it is that you've said something there like um, insurance is is very important for society like you, you cannot drive a car without motor insurance you can buy a house without home insurance so insurance is, is very very regulated not only that but also you need to to have a, a good sense that you know what you're doing and you are in control. So that is not that it puts limits as to what you can do with AI, but it sobers the mind. You know, like you have to be cautious because if things go wrong, they can go spectacularly wrong very, very quickly. And it's, it's not just you who pays the price. It, it's a good chunk of society. So that, that makes you cautious by nature, but it doesn't really stop things. It's just maybe a slower adopter because there is a lot at stake. But as you say, it's also an advantage now when things like the AI come in. There's very little there that we haven't been dealing with for forever in, in, in financial services. Yeah, and it's having it's having all the different stakeholders within the room, giving yeah. their different perspectives, ticking all the boxes, and making sure that your assumptions are parked or you're logging them to say, well, actually, we're making these decisions based on these assumptions. Let's let's re let's reevaluate that. So tell me a little bit about some of the problems uh, that you're helping solve for some of the customers that you're engaging with. Well, my my journey through um, data science has has evolved quickly in a way. You know, I think like most people, I started getting quite involved in the, in the modeling, and very close to the data, trying to trying to do things with that. But then you get to a point where you think you. You spend more of your time thinking about, you know, what are the ethical aspects of this? Is, is this right? Just because I can do it and I can get it with it. Is this the right thing to do? Or should I just put it aside? I'm still interested in the area. It's been a long time with that. I, I helped the European insurance supervisor for writing some guidelines for responsible use of AI. That was fascinating piece of work. Very rewarding from a personal, professional point of view. But now my main focus with my clients uh, is, is helping them in that area but also uh, adopt AI in a more strategic way. You know, like generally you're very enthusiastic and, and, and new technologies come in and you want to make the most out of them straight away. It's, I think my contribution is more like, okay, but that makes sense based on your strategy and your business goal. Maybe you could get more value doing something that is not so sexy, but it's going to have a bigger impact on your, on your business, your shareholders, your customers. So I, I held them in that area. A few weeks ago, I delivered a workshop on uh, on precisely that, you know, when, when companies have done a few projects and they run out of ideas, I, I provide them a framework on how to generate more ideas, more projects that will align with your strategy. That's that's what I like doing right now. Having that framework 
rather than motivation, inspiration can kind of peter away, but sticking to the framework. But also what's good about having the framework is that you can decide that if, if a key decision maker isn't involved, they can still continue on the roadmap yeah. because it's really clear for everybody in terms of what they're managing through. So talk me through that strategy, leadership, data journey to make sure that you're in the right place that you can then get a customer-centric, employee-centric approach? I think the, 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 the starting point is having a, a strategy and a clear vision of, of where you're trying to go and where you, what you're trying to achieve. And what that looks, say, let's imagine you've been very successful in that. What does that look like? You know, and then you start, in a way, to reverse engineering that. And it's, okay, what do we need for that to happen? You know, what kind of things, what kind of success do we need to achieve? And maybe that is, to increase your customer base, to attract more customers. Okay, how 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 does that work? And you realize, well, we need to start losing fewer customers, but we need to start attracting more. That's already giving you two options there. And you can work on both and say, what do we need to do to attract more customers? And, and, and very quickly, you start getting into very specific actions that you can undertake. Sometimes that means uh, developing an AI model that helps you identify customers who are more likely to, uh, to purchase your products. And, you know, you can develop some models that help your salespeople prioritize uh, opportunities and so on. And that's generally, you know, it is, I, I don't think there is anything there that is rocket science, but sometimes you need somebody to put it in front of you to say, actually, yes, that makes sense now. And it gives you an idea of how you can continue doing that every every strategic cycle. Yeah, because sometimes the, the, the outcome you want isn't going to come from the problem you're looking to try to get solved. It's, it's actually just more of a symptom. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, like something I, I always remind my, my clients is that not all solutions require AI or very sophisticated uh, things. Like sometimes you just need to listen to your customers and believe them. You know, like not, not try to second guess what they're saying. Like, no, no, just take them for face value. What are they saying? Maybe that's what they want. This is where the sent sentiment analysis becomes in very, very important yeah. from either in, uh, internal surveys, focus groups, or social listening outside on the web and gathering that and actually then uh, getting analysis on it to see what, what are the most important issues rather than the issues that we think are important or the trends that are saying that. So this year, you're a judge for the AI Awards, which we've got applications open for now. And thank you so much for that. Tell me about what you're most looking forward to judging this year's applications. I'm actually really looking forward to, to seeing the, the variety and the creativity in the application. You know, I want to see how, how people are solving the business challenges in a creative way, how they're coming up with clever ideas, how they implement them, and how that's adding value to, to their, their, their businesses, their clients and society in general. You know, some, sometimes because I come from a heavily regulated background, that heavy regulation can, can either spark tons of creativity or it can stifle it. So I, I always like to see what people uh, that come from other industries that don't have those wonders, what they, what they can do, because sometimes they, you know, the world is your oyster, there's nothing stopping you. So what can you do when you, when you have no boundaries? Yeah, it, it's interesting because you, you, you're gonna be creative, but also I think these well-rounded projects need to have that ethical steer to them. Yeah. They're using the technology because it needs to be done rather than wouldn't it be cool. Yeah. And then there's actually a, you know, an outcome. To, to, to actually doing that, either the customer experience improves or the employee experience improves or you're more productive or now you've got different insights as well, which, which is great. What advice would you offer to companies in the financial services who are kind of holding on tight to Excel, kind of being hesitant to kind of going on that journey to starting to get some type of uh, analytics or machine learning that they can start to get closer to their uh, customer? I would actually say I would I would suggest them to trust their own employees, because there are, um, in my experience, at least in insurance, uh, actuaries are are really passionate about uh, about adopting new technology. Like um, we we started our data science working group at the Society of Actuaries six years ago, and now is it is the most popular working group of the Society of Actuaries. Like uh, for the for example the our annual convention, fifty percent of all the submissions or events, presentations, and talks were all about data science. Like the actuaries and employees in insurance companies are passionate about using Python instead of Excel, R, or anything like that. But sometimes businesses are quite, 
conservative and say, okay, what if, what if our Python expert moves away? Who's going to come next and take over what, what's been done? And I think that was a, a valid challenge maybe 10 years ago. But now it's actually uh, most actors come out of, the, of their degrees with that knowledge. So it's not so much of a barrier as it would have been 15 years ago. So I would just simply say, just trust your employees. They know what they're doing. They are clever people, and uh, you'll be you'll be actually better off than, than, than relying so much on Excel. Pedro Ete Serrano, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today, telling us a little bit about your background, being working in the world of actuarial studies and also data science, and bringing them together and working with businesses to help them shape their data science uh, projects and generating the best experience for their employees and their customers. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. On the 26th of November, join us for the 6th Annual AI Awards at the Marco Hotel in Dublin. This year's event promises to be our largest and most impressive yes, with over 300 community members in attendance and over 48 applications of AI in action. This truly is an incredible world-class event and we are inviting you to this event. Experience the excitement live because we're going to be capturing this with a world-class film crew and it's going to be streamed online. However, if you want to join us in person, Book your table now because opportunities are limited. If you're interested in sponsoring this year's awards, please contact me at Mark at AI Awards for more information and see the best in class of AI applications on the island of Ireland.